You know, if we were to share our favorite photographs on our phones with one another, we'd likely see endless pictures of, well, it depends upon our context, but our kids and our grandkids, our family gatherings, you know, that one last Christmas or the 4th of July picnic and pets, lots of pets. Some of us would have pictures of muscle cars and baseball games. Others would have pictures of favorite restaurants, the best burgers we've ever eaten. And happy times and happy places, maybe with happy beverages with little umbrellas. But most, if not all of us, would have pictures of sunrises and sunsets, waterfalls and mountains, oceans, lakes and forests. We'd have pictures of places we've been in the world that we'd return to in a second if we could. Most, if not all of us, could share favorite photos of our vast creation that just takes our breath away. Well, this, of course, raises an important question. Why? I mean, what is it about our experience with the natural world around us that connects us so intimately with the Creator? I'll tell you right up front that I think God has a purpose for this. It's, it's the gift of our spiritual wiring. It's intentional on the part of the Creator. The Creator, God, has created us to appreciate the stunning beauty all around us because our Creator wants to be known and seen and heard and smelled and touched and even tasted in creation. In 2014, the Pew Research Center in Washington, D.C. published the findings of their landmark religious landscape study. It revealed that even people with no religious affiliation reported that the outdoors was where they had an experience of the Spirit, of God, that was unmediated and unfettered, uncomplicated by dogma and doctrine. In the yellow, pink, and white petals of the Minnesota Lady Slipper, in the vast expanse of the Grand Canyon in Colorado, in the quiet meandering of the headwaters of the Mississippi, people directly experience the closeness of God's presence in a way that nothing else can. In the beauty of the sunrise in the eastern skies of Apple Valley, and the sun setting behind the Prince of Peace cross tower, we experience an awesome, transcendent God who has given us this sacred earth to enjoy and to nurture. We're beginning a short series called Sacred Earth. The guiding narrative for the next three weeks is that our connection with the earth grounds us in our faith because caring for God's creation helps us understand God. We'll consider how the seemingly insignificant decisions we make each day can greatly impact the environment around us. We'll talk through some very practical ways to improve and protect the creation that God entrusts to our care. And today, we'll explore the majesty of God's creation and why our earth is intrinsically worthy of our careful stewardship, not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of the entire world. We're also making available to you the bold and comprehensive social statement of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, to which this congregation belongs. It acknowledges that we're part of God's magnificent creation, that we are connected with every other part of the creation, all living creatures, plants, trees, every kind of growing thing, the climate, and the minerals in the ground we walk on. There are rich spiritual lessons to be learned in the lifelong process of recognizing our connection to the earth, our place in the ecological web of life, and celebrating the gift that we can know God through deeply knowing and experiencing creation. You might expect that passages in Scripture that celebrate God's creative presence are as numerous as the photos on our devices. For instance, in Genesis 1.31, we read this, God looked over everything God had made. It was so good, so very good. A little bit later in Psalm 19, verse 1, we read, 
The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. From the beginning, God intended for all humankind to know God by experiencing creation's wonder, power, and beauty. A little bit later on in the book of Psalms, Psalm 95, verses 3 to 7, we read this, For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are His also. The sea is His, for He made it and the dry land which his hands have formed. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord God, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And then in Psalm 104, verses 24 and 25, the psalmist writes this, What a wildly wonderful world. God, you made it all with wisdom at your side, made earth overflow with your wonderful creations. Oh, look, the deep wide sea brimming with fish past counting, the sea teeming with creatures innumerable, living things small and great. Again and again, we see that God's heart intended for all humankind to know God by experiencing the wonder, power, and beauty of creation. When we look around at all of the beauty in the world and acknowledge God as the creator, that everything we have is a gift from God and that we can see God in creation, that that changes how we treat the created order. How we understand the environment as a gift directly reflects how we understand God. To fail to care for the gift that God has given us is to fail to acknowledge God as creator. But it's in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 20. We read the Apostle Paul's words. He captures the essence of experiencing God in nature when he writes this, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see God's invisible qualities, God's eternal power and divine nature. So, they have no excuse for not knowing God. But friends, we know this. With awareness comes responsibility, right? God has set us in charge, has made us stewards of the beautiful world around us. God has called us to care for this sacred earth. See, here's the reality. If we're not careful, we'll miss what's right in front of us. And God is always right in front of us. So how does that happen? How do we miss this? How do we miss God's wonder, power, and beauty in creation? Well, a couple of ways. First, we go about our routines without wonder. We've let ourselves become so busy that our overdeveloped schedules determine what we look at, what we hear, what we smell, feel, and even taste. Life becomes so routine and monotonous that the wonder, the power, and the beauty simply disappear. English writer and philosopher G.K. Chesterton responded brilliantly to all of that when he wrote this. Grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony, but perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that God has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our Heavenly Father is younger than we. The repetition in nature may not be a mere reoccurrence. It may be theatrical encore. What happens is that we think nothing of missing everything. We miss the forest and the trees. Unless we train ourselves to slow down and observe the beauty around us, we miss God's endless sermon through creation. Consider this. Because we walk less and drive more, we miss so much between point A and point B. And God is always between here and there, between point A and B. 
Think of the last time you were in a hurry to get somewhere. Go ahead, I'll wait. You hopped in your car and you raced off. You got to where you were going, did what you were there to do, then you hurried back home. Maybe you opened the garage door, drove in and then lowered the garage door without even noticing the beauty all around you, including your neighbors, each one of them created in God's image. You know, when we do that, and we all do that, we close the door on opportunities to experience God in the lives of our neighbors. We don't see how the buds on the trees are ripening. We don't notice the robins in the trees, the clouds in the sky. Not only that, but when we stop to think about it, we can't even remember how we got to where we went in the car in the first place. So it's no wonder that when we do head out of town for a weekend and get to get caught up in the beauty of wilderness, we look up in the night sky, the only words we might have then and there are, that's amazing. To say nothing of expressing gratitude to God for the billions of stars that we see. We miss the forests and we miss the trees. The words of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 25 and 26 come to mind. God says, so, Who is like me? Who holds a candle to me, says the Holy One. Look at the night skies. Who do you think made all of this? Who marches this army of stars out each night, counts them off, calls each one of them by name, so magnificent, so powerful, and never overlooks a single one? Friends, we can know God through deeply knowing, experiencing, and caring for creation. So, How do we do that? Let's get really practical. Let me suggest just a few spiritual habits and disciplines that you can practice this week. First, be quiet. (laughs) Just be quiet. In today's world, we're bombarded with noise. In the urban and suburban areas, we live with the constant hum of traffic on the highway, car horns on the streets, and sirens in the neighborhoods. In the rural areas, we live with the constant, distant, natural noise of land developers and maybe hunters. In our offices, we live with white noise, a a constant hum that camouflages the voices and conversations of people gathering and meeting and having conversations in open areas. And in our homes, we live with the constant noise and distraction of the sounds of the television or the radio, the stereo, maybe children, uh, cooking, uh, water running. And as a result, our lives are filled with noise. So how can we be more aware of the presence of God in our noisy, busy lives? How can we be attentive to the whisper of the Spirit each day? There's that passage in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 11 and 12, where Elijah is at his wit's end. He's seeking God's direction hope and peace, and his life has become so noisy that he he can't see or hear God. So the, the Lord says to Elijah, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. The point here in part is that while we can certainly know God in creation, it's not always going to be some huge earth-moving moment with a flashing neon sign. Instead, it might be something we could only experience by slowing way down. So here's a practice to help us do that. Just sit quietly in a quiet room at a quiet time of the day. Try to become more aware of everything in the room. Notice the sounds. Notice the silence, the the creaks, the, the wind outside or the lack of wind, maybe a draft, the humidity, the aroma, the temperature, your body, the furniture, the light, a chair, the texture, the fabric, colors. Try to notice those things. 
And then consider what you can't see. Radio waves, television waves, microwaves, cellular phone conversations. They're all going on, but we, we, we can't see them. But we can know God deeply and experience God transcendently through quiet places in our lives. Second, go outside. Connecting with the creation and being reminded of God's goodness is a powerful way to motivate ourselves and others to care for what's around us. Research shows that spending time outdoors in creation is so good for us in so many ways, mentally, physically, spiritually. This has ancient roots in scripture. In Psalm 8, verses 3 to 9, the psalmist writes that many of us have experienced this. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, O God, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. The flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean currents. Oh, Lord, oh, God, your majesty, your name fills the earth. It's fascinating to me that we can encounter the creator of the universe through our physical senses and that it's possible to encounter God through what we hear, see, and smell, and feel, and even taste. Again, ancient wisdom bears this out. King David writes in Psalm 34, 8, Open your mouth and taste. Open your eyes and see how good God is. Blessed are you who run to him. So friends, go outside. Get out there. Set aside some time this week to be outside and be open to how you hear and see and smell and feel and even taste God's presence. Give thanks for what you experience and what God gives you as a gift at that moment. Look at the gift of your home. Look at the gift of the landscape around your neighbor's home. Notice the plants the trees. Be aware of the aroma of things coming to life all around you in this season of resurrection. And then share with a friend or family member what you noticed, what you saw and heard and experienced. Give thanks to God for creating such a precious and amazing world. Third, commit to one thing for one year. I love this. This is so good. Sometimes trying to do too much too soon can feel overwhelming. The key to this partnership with God is to ease into it on a small scale. Just commit to doing one thing for one year. For example, a woman from Australia challenged herself to refrain from buying new clothes or shoes or accessories for 12 months. She acknowledged in an interview that I read that, that we make daily decisions about the kind of world we want to live in by how we choose to spend our money not just in what we consume, but how much. Her decision to stop buying new clothes became a spiritual discipline, prompting her to pursue abundant life in God rather than an abundance of things. Now, there are many ways to embrace these habits that help us draw near to the Creator. For example, Kevin committed to turning off the lights in rooms where no one was sitting. Lisa brought her bags to the grocery store, and Patrick decided to walk instead of always driving everywhere. So, this week, set an intention. Think of a few things you could do to make a small impact. Then choose one thing to do for an extended amount of time. And finally, friends, pray. We certainly do not have all the answers to the many challenges facing our world today, which can feel overwhelming. I know that. A good place to start is with prayer. You could pray in your own devotional time around a dinner table as a family or invite your faith community or small group to, to pray for God's creation. The renowned early 20th century theologian, pastor, and seminary professor Walter Rauschenbusch penned a prayer that captures the essence of knowing God through deeply knowing and experiencing creation. 
Let's pray this together. Oh God, we thank you for this earth, our home, for the wide sky and the blessed sun, for the salt sea and the running water, for the everlasting hills and the never resting winds, for trees and the common grass underfoot. We thank you for our senses by which we hear the songs of birds and see the splendor of the summer fields and taste of the autumn fruits and rejoice in the feel of the snow and smell of the breath in spring. Grant us a heart wide open to all this beauty and save our souls from being so blind that we pass unseeing when even the common thorn bush is aflame with your glory. O oh God, our Creator, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen.